After working on two more films, The Three Worlds of Gulliver and Mysterious Island, Ray would go on and make what would later be considered his masterpiece, Jason and the Argonauts. It's the story of Jason, who returned to the kingdom of Thessaly after a long voyage. But what he didn't know is that a man named Peleus killed Jason's dad, the king. He knows that there's a prophecy saying that he will one day be overthrown by the king's child, but in order for that to happen, Jason must need the Golden Fleece. So with the help of his crew, which includes Hercules and the help from Hera, Jason must fight his way against several different monsters and get the Golden Fleece to claim the throne. The idea for this film started around the same time when Ray thought about making the Sinbad movie in the early 50s. He always wanted to adapt a story that came from Greek or Roman mythology. But it wouldn't be until he was working on Mysterious Island where he started to get detailed ideas for the movie. Speaking of which, at one point, he thought about making this into a Sinbad movie. After the success of Seven Voyage of Sinbad, Ray thought about a movie where Sinbad would join Jason to get the Golden Fleece. During the filming in Italy, it looked like they weren't alone. Everything seemed to be going fine until a giant ship replicating the Golden Hen came out of nowhere. Apparently, that belonged to the British TV series Sir Francis Drake. What happened after was that Charles Schneer shouted, Get that ship out of here! You're in the wrong century! Oh! Oh, well, I do, dear. Apologize. All right. I'll be on my way, then. Anyways, like Sinbad, there were several creatures that didn't make it to the cutting room floor, including Scylla and Charybdis, a centaur, and a Cerebus. To bring Talus to life, Ray got the idea of making him into a giant made of bronze after seeing the success of 1961's The Colossus of Rhodes instead of the 8-foot man of bronze in the original mythology. For the Hydra, Ray based this one on a classical vase painting and gave it more of a serpent and prehistoric look. But because of animating the seven heads simultaneously, for Ray, this was the most difficult creature he had to ever animate. But out of all the monsters in the movie, the one that Harryhausen fans and film buffs point out as Ray's magnum opus of his stop-motion career is the Skeleton Army. Which is like if you take that one skeleton from Sinbad and multiply that by seven. In fact, one of the skeletons actually is from Sinbad, but which one? I really don't know. But even if the Hydra was Ray's hardest work, it doesn't mean that the skeletons were easy to do. The scene may have lasted for about 4 minutes, but Ray could only make 13 frames a day for that. In total, he had to do 184,800 movements in a span of 4.5 months. When it was released on June 19, 1963, it was the first time that a Harryhausen movie was released as a single feature in top theaters in the US. Before, his movies had always been a part of double features in smaller theaters. As for its performance, it really didn't do well at the box office since it only made $2.1 million domestically. But regardless, as time would move on, like I said earlier, this would be regarded as Harryhausen's greatest work. Even Ray himself thinks that it's both his best and his favorite. In fact, even Tom Hanks thinks that too. Some people say Casablanca or Citizen Kane. I say Jason and the Argonauts is the greatest film ever made. Also, Empire Magazine ranked Talos as the second greatest movie monster of all times, right under King Kong. During the late 60s, Ray went on to work on two films that would bring him back to his very beginnings of his career, where he was just a young boy using his stop-motion skills to bring dinosaurs back to life. The first of that was the 1966 One Million Years B.C., a remake of the 1940s One Million B.C. that starred Raquel Welsh, and the other was 1969's The Valley of Guanji. It's about a cowgirl named TJ who owns a struggling Wild West show. She hopes that the one thing that will really bring people into the show, it's this puny little horsey. 
However, the gypsies of the town are shocked to see the thing since it came from what they call the Forbidden Valley and brought the little guy back there. But when TJ, along with her ex-boyfriend Tuck and a paleontologist, Sir Horace Bromley, try to get it back from the valley, they encounter more chaos with dinosaurs, including a big one that the gypsies call Guanji. So in short, cowboys and dinosaurs. How the fridge are there not more movies with these two things together? That doesn't count! The idea of this movie actually started all the way back in 1941. It was an idea thought up by Harryhausen's idol and mentor, Willis O'Brien, that would have been a follow-up to King Kong. The plot of Willis and a bit of Harryhausen's version was actually very similar to Kong, but with an Allosaurus named Guanji captured for a Wild West show, and it would have been titled The Valley Where Time Stood Still. He started pre-production and did some artwork shown here, but after RKO changed their leaders, the whole project just stopped. Unfortunately, O'Brien passed away before filming began on Harryhausen's version, and Ray forgot to give Willis credit for the original screenplay, something that he has forever regretted to not do. The design of Guanji was based on one of Charles Knight's most famous paintings that depicts a T-Rex. As for the puppets themselves, they were all taken from older dinosaur puppets that got their armatures modified for them, like Guanji, the Ornithomimus, and the Styracosaurus, where previously a Ceratosaurus, a Ferrarachus, and a Triceratops. By the way, here's a cute story. After Ray was done with the animation of the film, his daughter Vanessa loved the Guanji puppet, so Ray decided to give it to her as a doll. Although, I like to think that it would make some really interesting tea parties. So what do you do, Mr. Guanji? I am known to be the ruler of my land. I am feared by all and I consume those that stand in my way. Even with their defenses, I am practically unstoppable. Well, that's very nice. Would you like some milk on your tea? I would actually like that very much, please. Usually, during the filming of his movies, Ray would always have what's called a monster stick to give the actors an idea where the monster is along with its height. For the roping scene, Ray would put the monster stick on a jeep so that the actors have something to use their ropes on. When it was time for the animation, he would put Guanji over the stick and animate him along with some smaller ropes to correspond with the ones used by the actors. Originally, Ray wanted to get a real elephant to perform its act on the show and fight with Guanji. But when he actually got the elephant, it was actually too small for him. This is what I like to call Harryhausen problems, when your elephant is too small to fight a dinosaur. This film actually holds the record for the most cuts that features Harryhausen's stop motion, with over 300 of them that he spent almost a year to make. When it was released on September 3rd, 1969, it was sadly a flop. People were getting less interested in watching monster movies and Warner Brothers barely did any promotion for the film. However, in 1971, they did re-release the film as part of a double feature with When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. But even if he started with them, this would be known to be the last film that Ray had to work with dinosaurs. When the Valley of Guanji failed, Ray and Charles knew that they had to come back with another big hit to recompensate. They decided that a surefire way to do it is with another Sinbad movie, which resulted in the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. In this one, Sinbad and his crew got a golden tablet from a homunculus made by an evil wizard named Kura. When Sinbad met up with the vizier, he coincidentally has a similar golden tablet, and by putting the two pieces together, it actually forms a map. So with the help of his crew and a slave girl with an eye tattoo in her palm, Sinbad goes out to solve the riddle of the map while avoiding Kura's evil spells and, of course, many different monsters. Like the first Sinbad, Ray thought of the concept and did some drawings of how it would be years before it was actually made. This time though, he did it for several Sinbad movies. However, not all the ideas turned into reality. 
one of which, called King of the Jennies, was supposed to have Sinbad with dinosaurs. But because of the failure of the Valley of Guanji, the whole project was scrapped and whatever Rei did conceptually for that was moved to the Golden Voyage. There are even some things within the movie that didn't make it to the cutting room floor, including a centaur battling a Neanderthal man. The man was switched to a griffin and he would later be used for Rey's next Sinbad movie. Also, there was a scene where Sinbad was supposed to be in the Valley of the Vipers, but Oh yeah, Charlie here doesn't like snakes. What's interesting to note in this one is that there are several well-known actors that were supposed to be in this, but didn't make it into the movie. Christopher Lee was close to get the role of Kura, British actor Graham Faulkner was supposed to play a major role in the film, and Orson Welles was supposed to play the Oracle of All Knowledge. But the last one didn't happen because Schneer and Welles couldn't agree on a deal for his fee. Also, Robert Shaw really wanted to play Sinbad, but ended up getting the part of the Oracle. Well, at least he's in the movie, right? Yeah, but he's playing a part where he needs to wear a mountain of makeup on his face and his voice was electronically altered to the point that he's barely recognizable if you know who he is. That and the makeup team glued some false teeth on him that when it's time to pull it out, well, uh, <laughs> some real teeth came with it. One thing that Ray was really happy to do in this film is that he was able to work with a homunculus, something that he always wanted to do since the Three Worlds of Gulliver. To give the movie something to delay Sinbad's quest like what Talos did in Jason and the Argonauts, Ray decided to add a figurehead of a ship that would come to life to stop Sinbad. What's weird about this is that, in reality, Muslims would never have figureheads in their ships, let alone one that depicts a girl. Anyways, what's interesting to note about the figurehead is that she actually has two different puppets, one that's kneeling for the ship, and one that's standing when it comes to life. For the actors to rehearse the scene where they fight against Kali, three stuntmen were strapped together in order to replicate the six sword-wheeling arms. Now that is something I wish I saw for myself. Anyways, for the score of the film, Ray got Miklos Rosa, who was his original pick for the score of The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. However, when Rosa came in, he wasn't happy that Charles only got him less than half of an orchestra. The entire goal of the film was not only to be another Sinbad movie in Harryhausen's collection, but also pay tribute to Ray's inspiration for the movie, the 1940s The Thief of Baghdad, by sharing Rosa as the composer, Kali doing the same dance as the six-armed robot in the 1940s movie, some Hindu-inspired design, and even the overall feeling of both films. By the way, one extra thing I'd like to add is that whoever did the closed caption for this must have gotten bored at one point and decided to spice things up while working. When Korra would cast an evil spell to summon dark spirits, the captions would say, If you didn't catch it at first, maybe this'll help. Also, there's this one as well. Anyways, when it was released on December 20th, 1973 in the UK and on April 5th, 1974 in the US, it was a major success making around $11 million at the box office, which far surpasses its small budget of almost a million dollars. The movie even helped Tom Baker, who played Kura in the film, get the part of the fourth incarnation of the Doctor in Doctor Who. Marvel Comics even made a two-issue adaptation of the film called The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, Land of the Lost, in their comics, Worlds Unknown No. 7 and 8. The adaptation was written by Len Wayne, and the art was done by George Tusca and Vince Coletta. 
1977, the third and final installment of the Harryhausen Sinbad trilogy was released, titled Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. It was still a success, but not as much as Golden Voyage both critically and financially. Fans and critics alike didn't like the more tongue-in-cheek tone, and even if it did well at the box office, it pales in comparison to another little movie that was released in the same summer, Star Wars. A few years after The Eye of the Tiger, Ray decided to return to another familiar territory for his next feature. Since he already worked around Greek mythology with Jason and the Argonauts, it shouldn't be hard for him to get into Clash of the Titans. At Mount Olympus, Zeus is angered over the fact that Thesis' son, Calibus, not only turned the Wells of the Moon into a barren swamp, but also killed almost his entire collection of flying horses. As punishment, Zeus turned Calibus into a hideous beast, and his destined bride-to-be, Andromeda, would instead be married to Zeus's son, Perseus. Thesis was not happy to what Zeus did to her little boy, and as revenge, she crashed Perseus and Andromeda's wedding and threatened to destroy the city of Joppa if the bride doesn't sacrifice herself to the Kraken. Now Perseus has to find a way to stop the Kraken and save Andromeda. The idea of the movie came from screenwriter Beverly Cross. As a former student of mythology, he made a story that centers around Perseus and Andromeda that would also connect itself to many other myths. He said in an interview with Cinefantastic magazine, I had the idea for Clash of the Titans in 1969 while I was living in Greece on an island called Skiathos. It was very close to Seraphos. The island where legend has it that Perseus, the son of Zeus, was washed ashore in a trunk. When he brought his idea to Schneer and Harryhausen, they immediately accepted, but also tweaked the story so it would have more monsters for Rey to play with. Because of Cross's involvement with the project, they were able to bring in some of the biggest names in Hollywood at the time, including Beverly's wife, Maggie Smith, Claire Bloom, and Sir Lawrence Olivier, just to name a few. By the way, Olivier was actually pretty sick while they were filming this. Uh, Mr. Olivier, we're ready for you. Just a minute. Let me draw some of your strength, dear boy. When Harry Hamlin got the role of Perseus, he had a choice to either do this or a film adaptation of Tristan and Isolde that would feature Richard Burton. The reason why he chose Clash of the Titans was because it would give him the opportunity to work with Laurence Olivier. Also, this would be his first time in a lead role along with another film released in the same year, King of the Mountain. Originally, Calibus was supposed to be just a stop-motion character with no dialogue. But after rewriting the script, which would give stuff for Calibus to say, they brought in Neil McCarthy to play the part and only use him when he has just a head or a half-body shot, while the stop-motion figure was used only when we would see his full body. At one point, there was a concern with the main character, not because of how he's written or how he looks or anything like that, but just his name. Perseus isn't really the manliest name out there. I mean, who's more likely to go on a testosterone-filled, beefed-up adventure? Conan the Barbarian? Marcus? Or Percy flying around on his magical Pegasus? Anyways, for the animation, Ray brought in Jim Danford and Steve Archer to help him with the stop motion. It would be the first time that Ray got some help since Mighty Joe Young. When creating the Medusa, he was bored of the usual representation of the pretty girl with snakes on her head. So Ray took the liberties to remake Medusa in his own image, one that's more ugly and puts more emphasis on the snake more than the girl. However, the biggest challenge for Rey in this movie is to not only animate Medusa in a more snake-like fashion, but also to simultaneously animate the 12 different snakes on her hair. On the plus side, his buddy Ray Bradbury said that the whole Medusa scene was the best thing he ever photographed. Speaking of the scene, Perseus was supposed to cut Medusa's head off by throwing his shield like a frisbee so that the censors wouldn't be as harsh to the film. However, 
Harry Hamlin really didn't like the idea, and it doesn't feel as accurate to the Greek mythology, and rather wanted to use his sword instead. He even threatened to quit if that wasn't changed. Well, as annoyed as Ray, along with Charles and the director was about the situation, they decided to work with him, and so, the sword it is. For the Kraken, there were two puppets made for the movie. A small one that they mostly used, and a large one that would only show his upper torso for one shot with the Pegasus flying in front of it. By the way, is it me, or does the Kraken look awfully familiar to another Harryhausen creature? Anyways, during the production, Harry and Ursula Andress, who played Aphrodite in the movie, had a relationship and even had a son, Dimitri, in 1980 after the filming was complete. Although the relationship itself didn't really last long. When it was released on June 12, 1981, it was the 11th highest grossing film of the year, making around $41 million at the domestic box office. During that same year, Alan Dean Foster made a novelization of the film, and in 2007, Blue Water Productions made a sequel comic series of the film called Wrath of the Titans, which Ray himself authorized. In 2010, Warner Brothers released a remake of the film, and it sucked! I know I don't usually bring my opinion in this, but I'm sorry. The remake is just a big budget idiot fest that just craps on both the original and the audience's intelligence. Now, I haven't seen the 2012 sequel of the remake, Wrath of the Titans, but after that insult, I don't think I plan to in the future. In fact, this scene alone can describe this movie best. What is this? Just leave it. Yeah, screw you too, you morons of the gods. Sadly, the original would be the last film for many people in this, like Donald Houston, who played Acrisius, Flora Robson and Frida Jackson, who played two of the Stygian witches, Ray's partner, Charles Schneer, and most importantly, Ray Harryhausen himself. But you guys might be wondering, why stop there? Why stop when his projects look like they're getting bigger and better? Well, he didn't really stop there per se. There were some more movies he planned on making after Clash of the Titans, but they all never came to be. Some of these include two more Sinbad movies called Sinbad and the Seven Wonders of the World and Sinbad on Mars, People of the Mist where he could have worked with Michael Winner, and a sequel to Clash of the Titans called Force of the Trojans. So why didn't they happen? Well, it all comes down to the real reason why Harryhausen stopped. Technology evolved. New companies like Industrial Lights and Magics came in with more advanced and better looking special effects that Ray's stop motion is becoming a thing of the past. Because of this, he had a very hard time trying to sell his movies since his magic is now obsolete. And so, in 1984, he retired from stop motion. However, he didn't retire from the entertainment industry entirely. In 1986, he created the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, a charity that helps preserve his works, including his puppets used in his movies, and goes on to promote the art of stop motion. After his retirement, he would go and make a few cameos in some movies, including the 1998 remake of Mighty Joe Young, Beverly Hills Cop 3, Spies Like Us, and the voice of the polar bear in Elf. In 2002, a couple of young animators named Seamus Walsh and Mark Caballero came to help Harryhausen finish an old project he hasn't completed for 50 years, a fairy tale short called The Story of the Tortoise and the Hare. The short ended up winning an Annie Award for Best Animated Short, and the two animators would go on to open their own stop motion studio called Screen Novelties. Some of their more notable works can be found in Robot Chicken, SpongeBob SquarePants, Mad, Courage the Cowardly Dog, and many more. 
But back onto Ray, he would receive many different Lifetime Achievement Awards for his special effects work, including an Oscar in 1992, which his friend Ray Bradbury presented the award, a BAFTA in 2010, and an award from the Visual Effects Society in 2011. He also found himself to be in several Hall of Fames, including the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2003 and the Science Fiction Hall of Fame in 2005. Ray would go on to live until his death on May 7, 2013, at the age of 92. Today, Ray Harryhausen is known to be the master of both stop-motion animation and special effects. He is also credited to be one of the most influential filmmakers of all time, inspiring many people that would become some of the biggest names in modern cinema history, including George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, Peter Jackson, John Landis, and many more.